With the 2023 summer blockbuster hit Oppenheimer, many are wondering, is it actually true to history? Well, here's a spoiler alert. It is, and it does stay true to history. But you might wonder, what does the average citizen, well, let's say the well-informed layman, know at that time about atomic power and where it might be headed beyond the war effort? We'll explore this in this week's episode of the State of Greater Western New York Report, which as always is brought to you by... Each week, our community makes history. Each week, you make history. And each week, there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to The Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The men in Honey Lake Falls line us Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome everyone to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Well, hi there and welcome everyone to this week's edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. We're going to be talking about something that's popular right now, right today, goes beyond Western New York. Although, if you're really up on the history of the Manhattan Project, you will know that Western New York was involved in a certain way. But, but we're not going to go over that history so, so much as we're going to stay, but take a step back into history. And we're going to be talking about what the well-informed average layman knows of or thinks of about the whole atomic movement that occurred right at the end of World War II. And we're going to go with the knowledge as of August 5th. Why is August 5th an important date? Well, let's get right started with this and begin to explore what's going on in the mind of the average, or should I say, well-informed citizen in August 5th, on August 5th, 1945. Well, let's start with this idea. It's, it's September, in September of 1945, many of the participants who were involved in the Manhattan Project returned to the Trinity test site with, for news crews and, you know, for pictures and all that. And here we have a picture of Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer, and Leslie Groves, General Groves, examining the remains of one of the bases of the steel test tower. This is from the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is in September. By that time, they had learned a lot of things about atomic energy, atomic power, atomic weapons that they did not know as of August 5th. Now, this site was located about 200 miles south of Los Alamos, New Mexico. It's, it's called now the White Sands Proving Ground. It actually had a different name just a few weeks before. They changed it to White Sands Proving Ground in early July 1945. And the first atomic test occurred on July 16, 1945. And the, deaths, the de detonation of this bomb, test bomb, really, in the subsequent mushroom cloud it, it was estimated to have yielded 25 kilotons of TNT. And here, here it is. This is the actual footage of the detonation on July 16th, 1945. Of course, the world found out about atomic weapons on August 6th, 1945, when the first of two bombs uh, were dropped. This one on, or first one on Hiroshima. Three days later, the second one was dropped on Nagasaki. And all this led to Japan's surrender. But the purpose today is to briefly describe the social consequences of the construction of the atomic bomb that could have been foreseen by a well-informed layman on August 5th, 1945. So since the advent of man, he has strived to attain more influence over his environment. And whenever his desire for control conflicted with that of another, the ultimate confrontation led to the downfall of one. As his creativity took hold, man began to make tools. 
And soon, however, it was discovered that not only could you make tools that were useful for activities like skinning hides, but they could also be implemented as weapons in terms of confrontation. And anybody who's watched 2001 A Space Odyssey sees this metaphor plainly in the beginning of the movie. As more conflict ensued, however, each individual tried to create a bigger and better weapon. Obviously, the man with the most efficient weapon had the best chance to overcome the adversary in battle. Up until August 5th, 1945, man's weapons were limited in one way or another. Uh, with the creation of the atomic bomb, though, the world witnessed the greatest man-made destruction ever, to the point where, really, total annihilation was now possible. Now, how do we define this well-informed layman? He's, he's an average person in a sense. He's not formally involved in the war scientifically, politically, or military. He is a layman, that's what we're saying. But he, he doesn't necessarily have an exceptional background in terms of education, but he displays enough intelligence and common sense to understand the technical aspects of the bomb and to make the logical conclusion of what would follow. So think of this person not necessarily as an academic scientist, but more as a practical engineer, somebody who can problem solve, who can put things together based on observations, and in fact, who does have access to certain classified military documents. We're gonna we're gonna say this only because it it'll make the discussion go a little bit better. And you'll you'll see, I'll make reference to the specific documents I'm talking about. But you know what? Even without these documents, he would still know about the existence of the bomb. Why? Because Pope Pius XII, when he addressed the Pontifical Academy of Science on February 21st, 1942, 43, so this is Two years before the bomb was dropped, he said, the thought of the construction of a uranium machine, that's what he called it, cannot be regarded as merely utopian. In other words, it's happening. He goes on to say, it is important, however, to prevent this reaction from taking place as an explosion and to break its course by apt precautionary chemical means. Otherwise, a dangerous catastrophe a catastrophe might occur, not only in the locality itself, but also for the whole planet. That's 1943. The Pope already realized the worldwide destruction that uncontrolled atomic actions or reactions poses. It's a threat to the entire world. That's 1943. That's publicly available. Everybody could see this. If you were watching, and we're going to assume that our well-informed layman is in fact well-informed. He knew these things. How did he know these things? Well, let's say he lives next to an extensive world library. This together with idle gossip, and by idle gossip, I mean just reading the, the, the weekly news magazines, seeing the advertisements in there, reading the reports that are coming out in the, in, from the journalists and about what's going on. So that's how he's well-informed. So he doesn't have, one thing he doesn't have access to is the personal letters and notes that historians today have access to. So he's, he's well informed. He knows a lot about a lot of things, uh, but he's just not, he doesn't have this perfect. So it's also very important to note that our well informed layman, he's also caught up in this patriotic war fever. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist John Hershey, who you see here, he said that it would be unlikely that our layman would care very much, if at all, about the consequences to the Japanese prior to their surrender. I mean, this is how much, really, hatred there was. I mean, I can't use any other word. Remember, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and America did not forget that. And, and while the Nazis were consider, considered the ultimate any enemy, it's the Japanese, really, who, at least from the American standpoint, received most of the, the, the vile, you know, attitude. So this layman would, would be caught up in the same sort of attitude as the rest of America. Now, as I said, it would not be extremely difficult for our hypothetical character to learn of the scientist's 
scientific aspects of the bomb. In the first two months of 1939, in fact, the science world was buzzing with news of fission. Fission was what was required to make the bomb. From a January meeting in Washington, D.C., to letters and articles published in such physics journals as Physical Review, Nature, and Modern Physics, the layman would be able to track science from the discovery of the neutron by James Chadwick on the left here in 1932 to the discovery of fission by Fish in 1939. He's on the right. And by the way, when I show these pictures and you see these letters and numbers next to the name, these are the actual ID badges from these people at Los Alamos when they were working on the Manhattan Project. Chadwick on the left here, he doesn't have one of these IDs. It's actually might be on his lapel there, but this picture was taken at Alamo. Now, as far as the military and political aspect of building the bomb is concerned, our layman would have guessed that prior to its surrender, Germany was well on the way towards building the bomb. Uh, you know, although there are some who say that the German scientists were delaying bomb production, Niels Bohr, after a meeting with Werner Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg was working for the Nazis at that time. Niels Bohr, uh, both of these are physicists, by the way, if you haven't watched the movie, uh, but they were very high level on the very top of the game in terms of physics. But Niels Bohr was uh, captured by the Germans and held hostage in Denmark until the Allies freed him. And at that point, he, he said, he told everybody about his meeting with Werner Heisenberg, and he believed that Heisenberg was what uh, was sent as an agent provocateur. So wanting to get some information from Bohr that might help the German development of the bomb. So he warned the Allied officials that Germany was building a bomb. With the fall of Germany and the discovery that they were nowhere near making a bomb, our layman might have felt the bomb was no longer necessary as Japan couldn't build one. Yet, in the name of science and common sense, that is, the possibility and the promise, really, of nuclear power, our layman would have probably assented to the need to continue research. Now, this sort of conflict, I'm, I'm assuming that in this part that the layman is probably less caught up in this patriotic field. In reality, if you read the magazines and the literature from July and August, early August 1945, there is no one who's not thinking about doing everything necessary uh, to win the war against Japan. So our layman would have also understood that the building of the bomb had uh, really another objective, and that was to defeat the Japanese without the necessity of a land invasion. But our layman wouldn't necessarily have realized that the invasion may have not been necessary. Some military advisors saw victory via conventional weapons as early as September of 1945. So they thought that, that if they kept bombing Tokyo, which is what they were doing, uh, car carpet bombing, same, fire bombing, same thing that they did in Dresden in Germany. But, you know, they bombed Dresden and they still had to go and invade Germany, uh, go into Berlin. They didn't win just by the bombing. Some thought they could do that in Japan, but again, the evidence was kind of weak. The Japanese. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. I'll just say that General MacArthur, who you see here in this famous picture, he actually laid out an invasion plan involving two landings. The first one was in Yushu in November of 1945, so he was not assuming that the Japanese would surrender by September. So that was the first one, November 1945. Then he had a second one on the Tokyo Plain in March of 1946. So he's well into this invasion plan really almost a year or well nine months after the bomb actually was dropped so he also stated in in his report that the japanese would fight harder on their home soil if you recall recall history the japanese fought very hard on the islands in the pacific and it caused sometimes 80 percent casualty rates uh, within the marines that landed on those islands so they were very tenacious fighters, and in fact, some of them continued fighting for years and decades after the war. They didn't realize that their home country had surrendered. That's MacArthur's view. General Marshall, George Marshall, uh, he saw heavy, heavy casualties. 
uh, sometimes anticipating up to 500,000, that's half a million dead. There was also the knowledge that a new prime minister, a moderate, was selected in Japan. But there was a much broader sort of reality with using the bomb and hastening the Japanese defeat. With, with Germany done, the Russians could now turn their attention to the East and help participate in the war with Japan. If the United States could get victory in Japan before the Russians would enter, that meant that effectively the United States would shut out the Russians from playing any role in negotiations with Japan. But nonetheless, our layman could comprehend the practicality of using the bomb. Indeed, he would have probably anticipated. You know, the expectation is, hey, we're not going to sacrifice our guys when we could defeat the, Japan, or the Japanese just by dropping a bomb or two. And uh, now here, there's, there are a few reports dealing with the proposed, mostly physical effect of implementing the bomb. In December of 1944, and here's one of these classified documents that for some reason our, we're, we're assuming our layman knows about. In December 1944, Zay Jeffries submitted a series of reports to General Groves. Remember, General Groves is in charge of the Manhattan Project. He, they were called the nucleonic prospects. Following the New Mexico test, so this is after July 16th, 1945, Groves issued his own report to Marshall. From the physical effects report, our layman would be able to know that projected destruction, roughly in the range of 14 to 17 kilotons, was lethal at only 1,000 feet. This was the report after the test. So it's lethal only up to 1,000 feet. It was extremely dangerous, 2,500 to 3,000 feet. Heat and flame would be lethal from 1,500 to 2,000 feet. And buildings would be destroyed up to two miles or ban badly damaged six to seven miles away. All of these distances are from the hypocenter, which is the ground zero of the blast. Remember, the bomb was blown up in the air, not on the ground, so they refer to the ground underneath it as ground zero. So that's what Leslie Groves said. Uh, it's interesting, remember, we're saying this is what people know as of August 5th. So we don't really, they didn't really know what the bomb was gonna do. They had some idea, but they didn't know how bad it would actually be. Oppenheimer, and again, this is his, from his ID tag at Los Alamos, he, uh, he had a, an interesting report himself. So Oppenheimer told the interim committee that the visually stupendous explosion would spread radiation up to two thirds of a mile. But what kind of radiation? What kind of what uh, you know what what we have here in in the, we'll, we can get some insight into this if we look at this film that was created almost immediately after the bombs were dropped called. A Tale of Two Cities. It was from the War Department. It was a film they made shortly after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki detonations. The military claimed that the reason why the bombs were exploded high in the air was to dissipate lethal radiation over a large area. So in other words, it would become less effective. Uh, exploding the bomb at an altitude rather than at the ground increased the blast effect, but decreased the radiation in General Crow's report. There is no mention of radiation at all. So our layman is left with this contradiction. You know, is radiation important or is it not? Still, it was known that radiation was dangerous at the time. They knew that. Maybe the physicists were a little bit more cavalier about it. Uh, certainly the engineers weren't. Uh, the radiation was considered to have the possibility to change material physically, chemically, and biologically. And it was still used uh, to a harmful degree in various medical treatment. All in all, we seem to know too little about the effects of radiation for our layman to bring it into his conclusions. One thing he did know for sure was that one atomic bomb would devastate an area equivalent to that of a conventional air raid, an entire conventional air raid. All right, so. With all this knowledge, 
as of August 5th, 1945, our layman could probably conclude some of the social consequences which would come out of building the bomb. We'll come back in a moment and uh, we'll, we will get to those, those things that the, uh, that the layman would understand right after this commercial. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are talking about what the well-informed layman knows as of August 5th, 1945, with regard to nuclear research, atomic research. And our, our, our well-informed layman really is well-informed. So it's not just an average kind of level of knowledge. It's a, it's a step beyond that. And as I said, you would have had access to some reports that might be classified. So, what does he know and what does he think about it? Well, first we'll start with some of the scientific community and see what they're saying about what's going on. So, they had already began to prophesy. And these conversations could have been available to our very curious layman. I mean, some of these efforts were not very well hidden. In fact, they were outside the normal, say, uh, uh, classified environment. One of these was Leo Zillard. Well, Leo Zillard, who's pictured here, as early as 1935, he foresaw grave consequences with regards to atomic weapons. 1935 was before fission was actually discovered. So he really was a leading thinker there. And he believed that the governments of the world would use the power of the atom for their political purposes. That's what he was worried about. Indeed, our layman might conclude, isn't that what is happening right now? So in other words, the government of the United States was using atomic research, atomic knowledge, for political purposes, really to help fight the war. So five years later, in 1940, after Ziller had instigated Allied atomic research, he had approached Einstein with the idea that the United States, by furthering atomic research on its own, might be responsible for initiating an atomic armaments rate. So this is after he started the whole thing. So five years later would be right around 1945. The, uh, so our, our well-informed layman would know that. Now, when Zillard actually presented this idea at the potential arms race, the Secretary of State, James F. Burns, Burns laughed it off, claiming that the Russians didn't have a trace of uranium. Niels Bohr, he had similar ideas to Zillard. He foresaw nuclear proliferation as a dominant feature in the East-West relations 
in the immediate post-war period. Gore, who had been concerned about the ramifications of atomic power, believed it would be easier if all the powers worked together in applying atomic energy than to use the bomb in war. Even his, uh, even this, uh, he admitted that this would pr uh, provide uh, uh, administrative difficulties, but in the end, he thought that all men could work, would work together. This was Bohr's common statement, and the one that our layman would hear the most. I mean, Bohr was very vocal about this. One thing about Bohr, though, is when you hear heard him speak, it was awful and difficult to understand him. That's why we don't really know what was said between Heisenberg and Bohr during that meeting during the war when Heisenberg came to Denmark to talk war while Denmark was under occupation. So Bohr concluded that with a nuclear cache in any country, no nation on earth would be safe without an agreement based on mutual confidence. Mutual confidence. Notice that word, mutual. So, also foreseeable by scientists and championed by Edward Keller was the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb differed technologically from the, uh, the atom bombs that were dropped on Japan. Those were fission bombs, hydrogen bombs were fusion bombs. And as the movie cleverly explains, how do you, how do you ignite a hydrogen bomb? Well, you do it with a fission bomb. So, either way, they had to create a fission bomb. Here's the picture of Edward Keller from his ID tag, Alamos. On the political side, Vannevar Bush and James Conant, so they were in the cabinet at that level, they, they wrote a memo to President Roosevelt, and uh, they, they really, uh, you know, kind of echoed what was going on here, saying that we should move forward. The last thing, the last element here is the controversy of radiation. So many scientists felt that the radiation was a criminal weapon and informed laymen might foresee international troubles for the United States, specifically with the Soviet Union, should the bomb be deployed. This is what some people actually thought at that time. They didn't want to drop the bomb on Japan. They wanted to test it on a deserted island just to demonstrate. Well, in effect, history now shows that that probably wouldn't have worked. Why? Because it took two bombs for Japan to surrender, not one. So in effect, the bomb was demonstrated first on Hiroshima, no surrender. So three days later, the second bomb was dropped. Then they surrendered. Now, here's the other reason why they didn't really test the bomb. They didn't have any. They only had two. I mean, three if you count the one that they tested in, uh, on White Sands. But that one was not deliverable. So they only had two bombs. They couldn't afford to test one and then have Japan do nothing, and then they dropped one. Well, obviously, one didn't work when, when, in reality. So in the end, it, it turned out to probably be the correct order of things. So once our layman has all this knowledge at his disposal, he could sit down in the evening, say, and just think about the ramification of this, the, the introduction of this new technology. What would he? Do? Well, first of all, using it would mean a quick Japanese surrender, which ultimately meant less loss of lives, not only for the Allies and Americans, but also for the Japanese. And certainly, all the Allies' families would be very happy all over the world. He would also kind of get the idea that people would see this as a heroic venture, the Manhattan Project as a heroic venture. And therefore, they would end up admiring and respecting those involved in the creation of the bomb, mainly the scientists. Furthermore, it's logical to perceive science helping society down the line with various atomic spin offs, not just toys, but helpful things, and especially nuclear power. That would be good. So, people's perception of science would change from that of something being simply an academic pursuit, just something with a practical and resulted. And here's where the engineering aspect comes in. There were a lot of theoretical physicists involved in the Manhattan product Project, but there were also a lot of engineers uh, or, say, lab, lab scientists. 
think of those as engineers. So they actually had to put this theory together into the real world and make something good out of it. So our layman could foresee that. Of course, you know, the admiration of science would lead to a sort of perversion of it. And this occurs in two different ways. One is science is now beholden to those who give the grants. So we're worried if science is now going to be honest or if it's just going to be used as some sort of uh, weapon in ideological wars, not a physical weapon, more of a propaganda type weapon. And that's still a concern today, obviously. But there's this other sense of how it might be perverted, and this is what was referred to as the crash program psychology. So that's where pressure is put on science to produce and produce quickly. And many people would utterly fail to see that the building of the bomb was a managerial and technical triumph more than an achievement of science. The science was already known. There were some scientific elements that they had to pursue and finalize and get right, but it really came down to the engineering of it and putting the whole project together. A lot of these crash programs don't work. We don't yet have a answer. Some of them do work. We landed man on the moon by the end of the decade of the 1960s. So we had this sort of attitude that could, could ultimately hurt some. So finally, the America itself would feel like a god among countries by dropping this bomb, and people knew that only America had it. But our, our layman would be smarter to assume that this would always be the case, because he would know that Russia, too, had competent scientists, and they, too, would soon build the bomb. This is without even the assumption of spies, although the spies end up facilitate building Russia. But once this would happen, America's greatness and prestige would be neutralized. In other words, we'd have two superpowers, and then more. So this, in turn, would lead to a cold war. And that's what Zillard and Bohr both feared. And if you have this cold war, again, the American country against the communist country, Russia, that would possibly lead to a paranoid reaction or a red scare similar to that of the 1930s. In fact, it did, and as we know, that's what really impacted Oppenheimer's career. Further down the line, if our well-informed layman is really thinking, he would see some sort of mad psychology where the stability of the world is based on mutually assured destruction. There's that word mutually again. Instead of mutually sharing like what Bohr wanted, this is mutually assured destruction, which nobody wants. As a result, Society would feel helpless to the bomb, and any romanticism of war would leave. And remember, there was still an element of romantic. You know, and why would it leave? Because you'd no longer have a human face, uh, where at least you could see your destroyer. Society, as Bohr predicted, would live in fear of the bomb. Now, everything that I just stated is what I think a very well-informed layman would answer if you asked him to describe the social consequences of the construction of the bomb prior to August 5th, 1945. Obviously, a lot has changed since then, but you know, you could never be sure of what will happen until it actually does. That's why that date, August 6th, and you know, you know what they say about 2020. It's all great and good. But still, as, as, as Paul Langevin said in the 1930s, scientific discoveries are more lasting than fiction. So there we go, a little bit of a step back in history uh, based on the popular movie Oppenheimer. And I want to thank everyone for listening today. And I, I did. Uh, anticipate a few questions. Hopefully I, I answered them correctly. If you want to be on the show, or if you want to be part of the live audience of the show, then you can 
go to this site, stateof.greaterwestnewyork.com, and you can actually sign up for free, register for free, and you will be invited every Thursday morning and see the show live when it airs at noon. Now, if you can't make it, because I know people work and they have lunch and maybe they're, they can't work, or they can't see if they're at work, you can watch it on our archive. It's archived in the afternoon. You see, go to that same site, stateofgreaterwestnewyork.com. Watch it there, or it is rebroadcast on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. So you like the Facebook page or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And at 1.30 every Sunday when it's rebroadcast, you will be notified that the show is broadcast. So that's it for this week. I want to thank everybody for being on the show or being or watching the show. And we'll see you all next week. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.